So first I'd like to introduce the concept of information or a mathematical, a quantitative measure for information. The starting point is a simple setup for a communication between two parties. There are two famous personalities that appear over and over again and they are Alice and Bob and they communicate with each other. Now the basic setting is as follows. Alice and Bob are connected via a communication channel. And classically, they send bits through this communication channel. So they transfer information in the form of zeros and ones. Now consider the following situation. Alice performs a random experiment. For example, she rolls a die. Let's say she rolls the die n times. So in statistical language, there are n trials. And in each trial, there are, in the case of a die, six possible results. So each trial, each trial will have a certain result. Let me call that result i, and it's somewhere between 1 and d. So to be general, let's say there are d possible results in each trial. And now Alice wants to communicate to Bob the overall outcome of her n trials. So she wants to communicate to Bob in the form of zeros and ones. She wants to communicate all n results of the n individual random experiments, including their order. So not just when she rolls the die a um, hundred times, she doesn't just want to communicate, I had 20 times I had 1 and 13 times I had 2, not just the frequency. But she actually wants to communicate the specific order. So she said, in the first trial I had a 1, in the second trial I had a 6, in the third trial I had a 5, and so on. So Alice wants to communicate the outcome of the, all the end trials, including the specific order of the results. She wants to communicate that to Bob in the form of zeros and ones. As regards the communication channel, that what Alice can send through the communication channel is a string of bits, so zeros and ones, and when she encodes the information, so she has this n results of her n trials in the specific order, in the specific order, she has to translate that into a string of zeros and ones. And that translation is called encoding. And she has to do that in, in an optimal way, so that she requires the least number of bits to communicate the result. So that is meant by the requirement that she uses an optimal encoding this means that she uses the minimal number of bits required to communicate the outcome of her n trials. What about Bob on the receiving at the receiving end? We suppose in this setting that Bob knows what kind of random experiment Alice performs, and he also knows the probability distribution for the various results in an individual random experiment. So if it's a perfect die that Alice rolls, then Bob knows my friend Alice is rolling a perfect die and the probability distribution for the different faces is that the probabilities are all 1 over 6. Yeah. So the two parties, Alice and Bob, may assume that Bob knows the probability distribution. Bob also knows the number of times that 
Alice is um, repeating the experiment so Bob also knows N however what he does not know of course is the specific order in which the results occur Bob does not know the outcome of this specific experiment of these N trials. Bob does not know that the first row yielded a 1 and the second row yielded a 6 and so on. Yeah? So Bob does not know um, the outcome of this specific experiment. Now you can ask quantitatively what is the amount of information contained in the message from Alice to Bob. I, I showed you what Alice and Bob know beforehand. They both know the probability distribution. Then Alice performs the experiment, communicates the result to Bob in the form of bits, and we can ask quantitatively what is the information content of this message. And this information content is defined mathematically as the number of bits needed to communicate the outcome of the experiment, assuming optimal encoding. So, information, mathematically, is defined as the number of bits needed to communicate the outcome of the experiment assuming the optimal encoding. This is the total information of the message. Then you can ask further to ask what is on average the number uh, that is the, the, the information the total information content of the message regarding all n trials. Then you can ask what is the on average the information content when Alice communicates the result of an individual experiment, an individual trial, what you do is that you divide this total amount of information by the number of trials. So you say then it's the average number of bits per trial. So let me write this down explicitly, more precisely we are talking about now the information I pertaining to the result of an individual trial. Yeah. So that's the, in that's the information content when Alice communicates to Bob the result of an individual trial. And that is defined in the following manner, it's the, you take the total message, so communicating the results of all n trials, you divide by the number of trials, and then you get the average information content of the result of a single trial. And finally, one looks at that in the limit n going to infinity. So it's a, it's a hypothetical setup where Alice performs infinitely many trials, communicates the results to Bob with an optimal code requiring the least number of bits and the number of bits needed per trial that is the average information content of the result of an individual random experiment, an in individual trial. It's, it's, a, it's an idealized situation that one measures information by counting the number, the, the average number of bits needed to store or to communicate a message. I won't give the full proof. Again, it will be touched upon uh, in, in one of the next problem sets
we can work on this more, but I want to, to motivate the general formula for the information um, with some heuristic, heuristic arguments. So let's try to, to motivate a formula for, info, for the information. And in order to do that, let's look at a few special cases. Let's look at the first special case where the outcome of the experiment is certain in the sen sense that there is nothing random about it. The probability distribution for the various results of an individual trial has the form that all probabilities are zero except for one particular out, uh, result. So it is certain that this result will appear. And then we can wonder what is the average number of bits needed for Alice to communicate to Bob the outcome of a, ran of a random experiment? How many bits does Alice have to send to Bob in this special case? None. No bit at all because Bob knows the probability distribution so Bob also knows that the outcome of the experiment is certain. There's nothing random about it. Therefore Bob already, already knows the outcome of the experiment and there's no need to receive extra information from Alice. The number of bits needed is zero. Yeah, because Bob knows the outcome beforehand and there is no need to communicate. Let's look at another special case. Let's look at a random experiment that has two possible outcomes and both outcomes have the same probability one half. That's the case when you flip a fair coin. Heads or tails and both are equally likely. How many bits do you need to communicate the result of a coin flip? You need exactly one. You say it's zero, you, you use zero if it's heads and one if it's tails or vice versa. You need one bit. Next special case. There are two to the power r possible outcomes. r is a natural number. And all outcomes are equally likely. So they are all 1 over 2 to the power r for all i. And r is a natural number. Do you know an example? What does that correspond to? If you have 2 to the power r outcomes and they're all equally likely? Exactly. Yeah? That's um, flipping R coins. And how many bits do you need to communicate the result of flipping R coins? Very good. Then you need R bits, well, which is the same as the log of 2 to the power R to the basis 2. It's the binary log of 2 to the power r. Now let's move on to arbitrary d. So we have an experiment with d possible results and they are all equally likely. 1 over d. Now this is, if you want to prove that mathematically, this, um, you have to put in a little bit more effort. This is not so immediate to see. But with this sequence of special cases, I try to make it intuitive for you that in that case, the amount of information is the log of the number of possibilities, d, again to the basis 2. It's again the binary log of the number of possible outcomes, if they are all equally likely. 
And now I give you the formula for the general case. In your general case, you have an arbitrary probability distribution PI, I going from 1 to D. There are no constraints, particular, particular constraints on this distribution. And for this case, the information content in the communication of an individual outcome of this random experiment. This is a function of the probability distribution and the general formula is minus sum over i all possible results going from 1 to d pi binary log of pi this is the general formula, formula for the information you can check whether you recover the special cases uh, listed above. Let's take the, the last special case where you have where all measurement results, all, all, all results of the random experiment are equally likely. So the PIs are all 1 over D. Then in this general formula you have the log of 1 over D it's minus the log of d. The minus cancels with the minus in front of the sum, so you have the log of the binary log of d. And then you still have the sum over i pi, but the probability distribution is normalized, so all probabilities add up to 1. So this is 1. And what remains is the log of d, the binary log of d. So you recover the special case given above. And this is the general formula. It was first stated by Claude Shannon. It's known as, the, as um, Shannon's noiseless, because there's no noise in the communication channel, noiseless channel coding theorem. This is work that Claude Shannon did in the 40s, and that is, you can, in a way, you can view that as the starting point of modern information theory. What if you, if you flip an unfair coin? Um, don't you still need um, don't you still need one bit per flip to communicate the outcome? Well here the here two aspects come into play. First that you you don't just communicate the result of a single experiment. But the assumption was that Alice performs many trials, very many trials. We are in the limit n going to infinity. So Alice flips many, many coins, not just one coin, or flips the same coin many times, not just once. And also Alice uses the optimal encoding. And she sends a message to Bob that contains the result of all the end trials. It's not that Alice communicates separately the result of the first flip and then the second flip and then the third flip, but Alice communicates in one package the results of all end trials. Let's take the case where the where the coin is heavily biased, so it's very unfair. So let's say that 99% is heads and 1% is tails. And Bob knows that. So Bob can be pretty sure that the majority of flips will give heads. Now let's imagine that um, Alice flips the coin a hundred times then the expected frequencies are 99 times heads and one, just once tail. Now if this is the case, then the way that Alice can communicate to Bob the specific sequence is of, of results of, in these 100 flips is all she has to do 
is she communicates to Bob which of the 100 flips gave a tail. And in order to do that, well, Alice just has to communicate a number between 1 and 100. And to communicate a number between 1 and 100, you need less than 100 bits. You need a lot fewer bits. Now, in this case, if you just, if you just have, uh, if you have 100 flips, then, of course, it can also happen that tail appears twice or three times. It's not certain that the number of tails is exactly one. But in the limit n going to infinity, we learned earlier when we talked about classical probability and these quasi-certain predictions that we can make, is that if n goes to infinity, then it becomes almost certain that the relative frequency of the various results equals their probabilities. And therefore, Bob already knows beforehand um, with almost certainty that he knows the frequencies of the various results. And then Alice just has to communicate to Bob the positions of the results in this sequence. And that requires fewer bits than just uh, uh, than if you communicated each outcome of each trial separately. And that's how you get the compression. Let's look at this information measure. Let me write it again. It's the information associated with the probability distribution PI. Shannon's formula was that's minus the sum of i PI binary log of PI. And look, let's look at some properties of this function. First of all, you can convince yourself, I'm not going to do this here, but you can convince yourself that this is a continuous function and it's also a symmetric function of the PIs. Symmetry means if you permute the PIs, you get the same you get the same information measure i. Right? It's just relabeling the results, doesn't change the information content in an outcome of the experiment. Another property, this information measure is non-negative. That's obviously something that you expect. Uh, the, num the average number of bits cannot be negative and also mathematically, you can check that also this function is never ne negative. And it is zero if and only if the probability distribution, the probabilities, are zeros and ones, i.e. the outcome of the experiment is certain. That's one of the special cases that we had discussed on the previous page. We said that um, when the outcome of the experiment is certain, Bob doesn't need any extra information, therefore the number of bits required is zero. And indeed, the, this function, this formula for the information satisfies this requirement. When you try to prove that mathematically, and I encourage you to do that, then you have to use the property that in the limit x going to 0, x log x is equal to 0. Uh, so you have to exploit that property and then you can verify um, that then the information vanishes. A third property, and now it gets interesting because it goes beyond uh, the special cases that we had considered. Information is additive in the following sense. Let's consider a combined random experiment. So let's say I flip a coin and at the same time I roll a die. And the coin flip has possible outcomes AI and rolling the die has possible outcomes BJ. Then I can look at 
outcomes of the combined experiment and um, these are connected with, with a logical end. So I can look at the probability for finding heads and uh, a, a three in my uh, die roll. So we look at the combined probability distribution um, for these outcomes of the um, combined experiment. Now what is the information content when I communicate to you the outcome of this combined experiment? It's the sum. It's the information content of the outcome of the first of these experiments plus the outcome of the second experiment but here's a little catch. It's not just simply I of the probability distribution for B. That would be the case if the two random experiments are statistically independent. If I flip a coin here and roll a die there and there's no relation between the two, there's no, there are no magic forces or influences between the two, then if I want to communicate to you the, the, the outcome of the combined experiment, then the number of bits I'm going to need is simply the number of bits that I need to communicate the result of the coin flip plus the number of bits that I need to communicate the, the result of rolling the die. It's just an, an ordinary sum. But it could be that the two experiments are correlated. In, in an extreme scenario, it could even be the case that the outcome of one of the experiments determines the outcome of the other experiment. As an example, take an, um, you have a box. In this box is, uh, are two beads. One is um, white and the other is black. And um, uh, blindly, I, I pick, I open the box and I take out one of the beads and I wonder, is it uh, white or black? This is a random experiment, and the probabilities are one half, one half. Then I could, I could take out the second bead and ask, what color does the second bead have? Now, of course, if the first one was white, I know the second one must be black, and vice versa. So there's a perfect correlation between the two. And therefore, I don't need, when I, when I communicate to you the color of the first bead that I, that I picked, then when I pick the second bead, I don't need any extra bits to communicate the color of the second one, because you already know that. It must be the other color. Yeah? So if you want to account for the possibility that the two random experiments are correlated, then the formula, look, look, formula looks a little bit different. <coughs> It has the following form. It's the sum over A, all possible outcomes of the first experiment, and then it's a weighted average. It's the probability of AI times the information content of the second experiment given the outcome of the first. So in here is a conditional probability. So let's say the first random experiment yielded the outcome A1. And then afterwards, the, and there's a correlation between the two random experiments. Then as the probability distribution for my second experiment, I have to use the conditional probability distribution given the outcome A1 of the first experiment. And then I have to, uh, if I want to communicate then the result of the second experiment, the, the relevant amount of information that I have to use, so the, the, sort of the, the, the correct number of bits, is, the, is this information measure evaluated for the conditional probability distribution. Now, I don't know beforehand which 
outcome I will have in my first random experiment, and therefore I have to take the weighted average. Weighted over the probability with the probability distribution of the first random experiment. That's how this formula arises and why it is um, it is plausible that it should have this form. Uh, so this is the additivity of information. Sometimes there is um, sort of uh, a, a shorthand notation that you say the information associated with the combined random experiment AB is the information associated with random experiment A plus the conditional information associated with B given the outcome of A. This is the compact notation for this additivity. So I, I hope to have convinced you that these are all these three are all plausible properties for an information measure. In fact, you can take an axiomatic approach. You can say these are properties that I expect that I would postulate for any reasonable information measure. And then people have shown, have proved that in fact the information measure above with this formula, the sum p log p, is up to an, a multiplicative constant, is the unique measure that satisfies these three properties. What's the meaning of I, of this information measure? It's the amount of information contained in my communication of the result of a measurement outcome. Another way of phrasing it is to say it, uh, I quantifies the amount of ignorance of Bob, of the receiver. Yeah? So it's, you, could, you can also say I have a random experiment with the probability distribution PI and this measure I quantifies my ignorance about the outcome of the experiment. If the experiment is, if the outcome is certain, my ignorance is zero because I know the result beforehand. If I have a uniform distribution, then my ignorance is maximal and it's given by the binary log of D, the number of possible outcomes. Now I would like to make the transition from information to entropy. Once again, I write this formula. This is according to Shannon, the information content, the information contained in the result of a random experiment. And the index i here in the probability distribution refers to the result of a random experiment. Now I'm assuming that in your in the thermodynamics course that you've already taken, you've seen the formula for the entropy. Now this is the, the classical formula. We come to the quantum version uh, later. So the entropy, there you use the letter S for entropy. It's also a function of a probability distribution, but now the index I refers to a microstate. So we have a microscopic system. It has many possible, it can take many possible microstates. We don't know exactly what the microstate is. We work with the probability distribution. And the probability distribution is PI, and I labels the microstate. The formula, Boltzmann's formula for the entropy is minus K, where K is the Boltzmann, is Boltzmann's constant, sum of I, PI, and now the natural logarithm of PI. This is the Boltzmann formula for the entropy. Perhaps you have seen it in the version 
k times log w, where w is the number of microstates. And so you have a given macrostate that is compatible with many different microstates. There's a number w of microstates. And then you say all the microstates are equally likely. And then we have already seen, as a special case of the Shannon information measure, that when the PIs, the probabilities, are all equal, they are 1 over D, or in the Boltzmann case, 1 over W, uh, then this more general formula, P log P, becomes log of the number of possibilities, and that would be here the number of microstates. So you, you obtain this formula, k times log of the number of microstates, in the case where all the microstates are equally likely, and the probability for a specific microstate is just 1 over the number of allowed microstates. Shannon's formula and Boltzmann's formula are identical up to a constant factor. Therefore, physical entropy, Boltzmann's entropy, can be interpreted as a quantitative measure for our ignorance about the microstate. In the same way in which Shannon's information measure can be interpreted as a, a measure for our ignorance about the outcome of a random experiment, Boltzmann's entropy can be regarded as a measure for our ignorance about the microstate. So let me I'll write down this analogy here. In the case of a random experiment, we had said that I quantifies the lack of information or the ignorance about the result of a random experiment. Now we are talking about physics, and in particular about statistical physics. And we find that S is a measure for the lack of information or the ignorance about the microstate. Now, this is the reason why I put so much effort in this, um, in showing you a little bit of information theory and motivating the Shannon formula, because entropy is such a central concept in statistical physics, and it's a concept with which many people have so much difficulty that um, I think it's worthwhile the effort to really give you a good intuition and understanding of the meaning of entropy. And I hope this, this helps a little bit. Yeah? So entropy measures our ignorance about the microstate. And this, in turn, will be the starting point later for constructing the macrostate. We'll come to that very soon. What I wrote down here, Boltzmann's formula, is the classical formula for entropy. We've already spent a lot of time talking about quantum mechanics. So it's only fair that I give you the formula for quantum entropy. When you have a classical distribution of microstates, PI, then Boltzmann's entropy, there was the formula minus Boltzmann's constant, sum over I, PI, log PI, the Boltzmann entropy. Now you, we go quantum. Quantum mechanically, we have, in general, a density matrix, rho, that describes our state. So the analogy here is really between classical probability distribution, PI, and density matrix in the quantum case. This density matrix has eigenvalues rho i. Yeah, so you can write rho 
spectral decomposition as sum over i of rho i times an associated projector. Now, if assuming that the um, eigenvalues are non-degenerate, then you can say the pi, they correspond to pure states. And one way of interpreting the spectral decomposition, it's not a very, it's not the, the most precise terminology, but you can view that as, like you can interpret that as by saying the system is with probability rho i is in the pure state i. I just don't know which pure state it is in, and therefore that's why I have a probability distribution rho i. So you can, you can say there's a correspondence between the pi classically and the rho i quantum mechanically. Yeah? The rho i describes the probability, it gives you the probability that the quantum system is in the pure state i. And a pure state corresponds to, or is a, is a microstate. So with this analogy, you can define, in the quantum case, an entropy, S of rho, which is minus Boltzmann's constant, sum over i, rho i, log rho i. So it's the same form as in the classical case, only that you replace the pi by the eigenvalues of the density matrix. This is the same as minus k times the trace of rho log rho. This formula is known as the von Neumann entropy. And this quantity measures the lack of information, quantifies the lack of information about the quantum microstate. We have already had a look at some properties of the classical entropy. Let's now look at some properties of the quantum entropy. Once again, the formula S of rho, that's minus k trace of rho log rho. Mm -hmm. First property, it's invariant under unitary transformations. Unit transforma unitary transformation of a density matrix means you multiply it from the left and from the right with u and u dagger. And the entropy that you get is the same as before. That's because unitary transformation does not change the eigenvalues. So the transformed density matrix still has the same spectrum. And remember how we introduced the entropy via the eigenvalues. They don't change, so the entropy doesn't change. This expresses the fact that a unitary transformation and hence time evolution, because on the microscopic level, um, the quantum state evolves via a unitary transformation. And that doesn't change the entropy. Yeah, this, uh, this is the starting point of one of the uh, great controversies in, in physics that on the microscopic level you have the second law. We come to that later in the course that entropy increases or can only increase. There's irreversibility. And that seems to contradict this property here that under a time evolution, which is a unitary transformation, the entropy is conserved. And there's, of course, a lot of interesting argument and interesting physics in how you can resolve this apparent contradiction. We'll come to that later. Second property, it's non-negative. Just like its classical counterpart, S of rho is always larger or equal to zero. <coughs> and um, S of rho is equal to zero if and only if the state is pure. And remember, this in turn was the case if and only if rho squared is equal to rho. So the entropy has a lower bound, which is zero. 
It also has an upper bound, the maximum value that the entropy can take is k times the log of the dimension of your Hilbert space. Again, this is just like in, uh, in the classical case. The maximum value that the entropy can take is uh, sort of you have maximum ignorance when you have a uniform distribution, when all outcomes are equally likely. In that case, the entropy is just the binary log of the number of possibilities. Now here, um, the analog of the number of possibilities is the dimension of the Hilbert space. You have equality, so S of rho equals K times log of the dimension of the Hilbert space if and only if you have maximum ignorance. Now what is which mixed state corresponds to maximum ignorance? It's called it's also called the totally mixed state and it has the form it's the unit matrix divided by the dimension of the Hilbert space. That's the totally mixed state. Then for the quantum entropy, there's also additivity in the following form. Consider several different mixed states. Rho, alpha. I use Greek indices to separate them from the eigenvalues of rho which were rho i, the rho alpha are different density matrices. I now consider the case where these different density matrices are mutually orthogonal. Two density matrices are orthogonal if their product is equal to zero. So this holds for all alpha different from beta. This generalizes the notion of orthogonality that you know from pure states and vectors in Hilbert space, yeah, they are orthogonal when their scalar product is zero. This generalizes this notion of orthogonality to density matrices. Now, if you have this kind of orthogonality, then the entropy associated with the weighted average of these density matrices is given by the entropy, the classical entropy associated with this probability distribution, P alpha, plus the weighted average of the quantum entropies associated with the rho alpha. Yeah, so this is a quantum entropy, and this is a classical entropy. H how can you understand that formula? Intuitively, you can say, I have a physical system. I don't know which state it is in. Or you give me a physical system, and you tell me, Mm, I don't know what state the system is in. Could be that it's described by density matrix row 1. Could also be that it's described by density matrix row 2, and so on. The probability that it's described by density matrix um, row 1 is P1. The probability, and with probability P2, it's described by density matrix row 2, and so on. Now, what is my ignorance about the microstate of that system that you give me? Well, I have two sources of ignorance. I have, first of all, I don't know which density matrix this, uh, describes the system. So I have an, an ignorance about which of the density matrices I must apply. And this ignorance is measured by the first term, by the classical entropy. It's the classical entropy with the probability distribution P alpha that reflects my ignorance about which density matrix I have to use. And then 
once I know which density matrix I have to use, I still have an ignorance about the microstate because the density matrix itself doesn't tell me which microstate the system is in. So then I have the quantum entropy S of rho that tells me my remaining ignorance about the microstate. So my overall ignorance, and that's what this formula tells, tells me, my overall ignorance is the, is the sum of the two. Yeah, it's my ignorance about which density matrix I have, plus the weighted average over all the possible density matrices of the associated quantum entropy, so the remaining ignorance about the microstate. And this formula holds only under the condition of this orthogonality, because otherwise you might have sort of different um, density matrices might be very similar to each other, and there might be overlap between the two, so it's not uh, perfectly additive. Uh, but you see, also on the quantum level, you, you find once again, you find these rather intuitive um, properties that you would expect from a reasonable information measure. I would like to show you two more properties and then we can conclude this chapter about information and entropy. One property is concavity and that means the following. Take an arbitrary set of density matrices, rho alpha, and again you have uh, there's an associated classical probability distribution, p alpha, then you can take the entropy associated with the weighted average compare it with the weighted average of the entropies. What do we have in between? Is it equal? Is it smaller? Is it larger? The left-hand side is larger or equal to the right-hand side. You can see that in a special case. Let's assume that you have row 1 and row 2. Let's further assume that row 1 and row 2 are actually pure states. This means that the quantum entropy of row 1 is 0, and also the quantum entropy of row 2 is 0. So the right-hand side is 0. But the left-hand side, uh, let's say you have associated probabilities 1 half and 1 half. Let's say row 1 corresponds to a pure spin-up state, and row 2 corresponds to a pure spin-down state. And then on the left-hand side, the linear combination, one-half projection operator spin up and plus one-half projection operator spin down, that's a mixed state. That's a mixed state that we've encountered many times before. And when you're in a mixed state, you don't know the pure state. You have ignorance about the pure state. There's an associated entropy which is non-zero, which is larger than zero. So in that case, the left-hand side is larger than zero, but the right-hand side is zero. And that, you can generalize that, that holds true for arbitrary choices. And the process of taking the linear combination of density matrices is called mixing. And what this formula tells you is that when you do mixing of states, then you lose information. So the physical interpretation is that mixing entails a loss of information. Yeah, like mixing in a source, you mix spin-ups and spin-downs, and then you randomly pick a spin, and suddenly you know less than if you had kept them separate. Yeah, so the, the mixing leads to a loss of information. And then one last property that's known as sub-additivity for a composite system A, B, you can look at the entropy of the density matrix of the combined system, of the composite system. And this entropy is always less or equal the sum of the entropies 
of the reduced states. Yeah? So this here, for example, this is a reduced state. And we saw today that how you cal calculate that, that's the partial trace of the row AB, the partial trace taken in A. What does that say physically? Remember, entropy is a measure of ignorance. Now, this says that if we are given the state of the composite system, if we are given the density matrix rho AB, our ignorance is smaller or at most equal than if we are given rho A and rho B separately, if we are given the reduced states. Or in other words, if we are given rho AB, we know more about the system, we know more about the microstate than if we are given only the reduced states rho A and rho B. Yeah, so rho AB contains more information, or perhaps equal, than rho A and rho B together. Why is that? That's again plausible because if the two systems A and B are correlated, then their joint state rho AB contains information about these correlations between A and B. But if you just look at the, at the reduced states rho A and rho B, you lost all information about correlations between A and B. So why is this the case? When you go from rho AB to the reduced states rho A and rho B, then you lose information about correlations. Yeah? So this entails a loss of information about correlations. When do you have equality? And this fits perfectly in this intuitive understanding of this, in, uh, this, uh, this inequality. You have equality, so rho AB, S of rho AB equals S of rho A plus S of rho B if and only if rho AB is the tensor product of the reduced states rho A and rho B. And when is the combined state, the tensor product of the reduced states, if and only if they are statistically independent, if and only if you have no correlations. <laughs>